I like the fact that, like, you know, if women are thirsting for me on, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm like, that's cool. I want that. Why not? Yeah, I think I'm sexy. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I thought, you know, now my heart's broken because he's gay. I'm like, no, nah, I don't got to be broken. You can keep on thirsting. You can keep on loving. I love all people. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think hopefully we're smashing some tropes and maybe I'm doing it, you know, you know, by just being who I am. I think that's cool, you know? Hey everybody, how you doing? Corey Coleman here, and it is the middle of the day. You know, if I'm waking up at this time in the middle of the day, I usually get up around this time. But if I'm getting up at this time, I'm getting up for somebody very special for another Double Toasted interview. And I am, uh, I, again, I feel so privileged and lucky to be talking to the person that we are talking to today from uh, one Coleman to another, Corey Coleman to Coleman Domingo. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good. You got you got the E. I don't have the E, but we're close. We're close. We're close. Somebody, and believe me, people corrected me on that because I, I think I spelled your name that way so many times. You have fans out there who are ready, who are ready to jump people on get people. Mad. They, they get mad. They're ready. They're ready to correct it. They, they know that it's been a, my thing for years. I'm like, because it's, it's only a slight different pronunciation from my name, actually. My mother, when she was alive, she always said Coleman. Because that was also my dad's name. So they say Coleman Domingo, which is a very slight thing, not Coleman. So I messed up already because I did say Coleman. I actually know you I know what? Corey you Coleman. You are perfect. You're perfect, man. You're perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me get that right. Coleman Domingo. There we go. Oh. Everybody. <laughs> and before we start anything here today, I just want to let you know. I have to let you know that you are one of the most stylish people that I have seen in a long time, man. I go to your Google page, and I don't, uh, I don't go to Pinterest anymore for any style tips or style influences. I go to your Google page right here, man. You well, are thank you. Apparently, incredible. Apparently, other stylists and fellow actors do the same thing because people be stealing what I've been wearing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> hey, man, steal from the best, right? I, I feel flattered. I, thank, thank you, though. I think I'm. I've, I've always had a sense of style for my parents. They love to dress. Like I come from, I'm from West Philly through and through. And also I have a, a father who is um, from Latin America. And so he loved to just wear all white and have his Cadillac <laughs> and a hat to the side. He always wore white, my dad. But my mom, she just, she always had a sense of style. She always had, always wore different wigs. And, you know, so I think I learned from, you know, these people I just admire. You know, and all these brothers that I admire, like people, I'm from Philly, so I like, I rep, you know, hard for like the Philadelphia international singers, you know, like Teddy Pendergrass and uh, the spinners. Yeah. So I feel like that's my style. Everything is always like, people are always like, do you ever wear buttons on your shirt? I'm like, no, nah, because the men I knew always showed a little chest. <laughs> chain. But that, that, that's just the, you know, I'm from those people. So that's what I do. I get criticized for wearing my buttons down a little bit too low too, man. So I'm glad to have some validation here right now. Me and you, me and you, the Coleman's. Of okay? course, from <laughs> Coleman to Coleman. But, Coleman to Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm here today, we're here today to, of course, talk about uh, your latest project. And it's a very interesting project uh, for you. We're here to take today to talk about your, uh, your animated short, which yeah, is man. New Moon. Um, and it's, if it's okay, it's a beautiful animated short and my background is animation and so i you know when i when i say i love animation i call it beautiful you know i'm very i'm very critical and i and i really do love what you've Thank done you. here is it okay if i show a clip from uh, course, from this i would love that in the backyard mom spoke of many places that she wanted me to see and things she wanted me to do like go to art museums and play instruments and i want you to go to the theater like the white folks and see operas and things. Travel the world, baby. Go far away from this neighborhood. But don't forget where you come from. And in your travels, don't forget to pick me up a caftan with the dome and sleeves, just like the one that Diana Ross wears in your favorite movie, Mahogany. You know, this is... Uh... This is the story of a boy named uh, JJ. Would you like to tell what this is about? I'm speaking on your project. You want to say what this is about? I would love to. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to actually start to talk about it. Because it's my first time really talking about the genesis of it and the why of it. 
But it all started actually with a, an inquiry from my friend Lori Latham, um, one of my comrades. She says, everyone, I did this solo show many years ago in 2008 in New York and in London and Australia. And it's called A Boy in a Soul. And it basically is a love story to West Philly, to my family, to the music that created who we are and sort of the, the power of transformation music. And so my friend Lori, people have been asking me for years, are you going to do the solo show again? Are you going to do it again? It was very popular, won many awards. And I thought, no, I was done with that experience. My friend Lori turned me on to uh, the thought of animation. She said, I feel like it lives in the animation space. And then I remembered a conversation I had many years ago. And when I started to meet with um, animation companies like Sony Animation, uh, just having general meetings in LA. And I sat around with these uh, folks, these executives, and they all told me, none of them had an animation background. I said, well, how did you get involved in animation? And then they told me their reasons. And they said, we think that you'd be great for animation in some way creating it because of the way you think and that there's no boundaries you can imagine exactly the world you want. So that sparked, my conversation with Lori sparked this thought in 2020, uh, in the middle of streets being on fire and and, and the, rate, the pandemic raging, I thought, what things can I create that really sort of like um, are, are, will be a balm uh, and an offering up to this world. And I knew that this short story was a centerpiece in my, um, in my play because it's really about uh, black boys and their mothers, basically. It's about mothers and sons and about um, overcoming many um, hardships uh, through the power of music. And I thought that's something I would like to see. I would like to see more stories like that. And so uh, I went on this journey. I reached out to these animators that I researched and researched and researched and saw their work. Two guys who live in Lyon, France. One doesn't even speak English. And I thought, I love their work so much. And I thought it was very old school. It made me feel like the cartoons that I grew up with, with mm. the mind drawings and all. And uh, I said, would you be interested in going down this journey with me? Now, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea of the, of the financial of it or anything like that. But I went down this road and I, I invested, me and my husband, we, uh, he runs my production company, uh, Edith Productions. We invested our own salaries in it. We were like, okay, let's take our salaries and invest in this thing that we're not really sure of we don't even know what it is um but we we felt that it could be something special and um and then it, after two years it was delayed by many um by COVID in many ways and we finally finished it earlier this year and then people said well what are you going to do with it and we didn't get to that part you know we just thought <laughs> we wanted to create something put into the world and so we just started submitting to film festivals and we got into our first one, which is the French Riviera Film Festival, which we won Best Animation. And now we've been accepted into all these other ones. It's, been, it's a blessing um, that are coming up um, and we are being honored. And it's just lovely, like Indie Shorts and Outfest and Fantasia and, and Canada. And so it's a lot of film festivals wanting to wanting us to share this work. So that's where we are with it. That was a lot. That was a lot of an answer, wasn't it? That's what we're here for. No, that may, <laughs> we're here to hear you talk about your project and to hear you talk and very passionately about this particular project uh, it, that's done in animation. It's, I was, you know, and you answered some things that I was going to ask you, which is great because, you know, I know that this is not your first animated project that you've worked on. Uh, one of the most acclaimed episodes of BoJack Horseman Mm. Uh, has you as I, I believe a what is it, a dragonfly? <laughs> yes, I'm a dragonfly who lost his wings, and he was very he was very uh, depressive, and he was he was crotchety. He was amazing. I loved. That's one of my favorite things I've done. To be very honest, when people ask me what what things do you, are special to you, it's that episode. To be honest. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> uh, hearing you talk so passionately about New Moon, and and now hearing you talk about how you love this episode of BoJack Horseman. Because uh, you you are you've directed you, of course you've acted on the stage film television but it seems like you love animation I mean have you always grown up loving animation You know what I guess I have but I, I watch like old school animation I watch like the Flintstones and things like that you know yeah. so I feel like I have a very old school um, idea of animation which is actually pretty simple whether it's like the Peanuts or something like that I haven't watched a lot of like you know. The, the newer animation, I think, is so beautiful, but yet slick, but it's also so, um, I don't know, it just feels like almost too advanced for me. I think I like a little <laughs> old school with it, like simpler line drawings and color palettes and all. 
Um, like even with, with uh, our animation, Raul did all the rotoscopy, which is basically every single frame that's been storyboarded is actually me. And it's me wearing a head wrap to play my mom, me as a little kid, uh, and myself. So we did every single frame is is me. So it's old school rotoscopy and then line drawings. And of course, as hopefully people can gather, or maybe not, that I play all the voices. I play my mom and play myself when I'm younger and, and me. Yeah. No, I, I actually, I, I, I recognized you doing the voices, but it's funny, you know, uh, I, I'm looking at the faces now, and I can see what you're talking about. That those, yeah, there you are. That's you. <laughs> yeah. that, that's my whole body and everything. It's just me with the head wrap on, and like, and we, th there were hours of rotoscopy. Like again, going down the road of animation, I had no idea how to do it. And so when we were going back and forth online, and remember, I've never met my animators. I've never been in the room with them at all. Still, we did. We've done every single thing online. So it's been a. It's truly an act of faith and trust, um, especially, and I think maybe, especially at this time, when you're really mm -hmm. needing to lean into that to create some work together and build bridges together, I think it was really, um, it, that's very significant, you know, like trusting some strangers with your story um, and trusting that they will deliver, and they have. They, um, you know, these guys who I think they don't have a lot of experience with the African-American experience in America, yet they're, as animators, they, they, I think that, I don't know, there's something about they can get to the soul of these um, these characters. I mean, they, we did, we had drop boxes filled with pictures of my mom and my neighborhood and me and things like that. And they wanted to get everything like the color, the sound, the, um, you know, all the audio, uh, all of that stuff was like every single detail, the wind, the chimes, how, asking me questions, how Philadelphia feels in the summertime. You know, would I be barefoot or not? You know, <laughs> but every every single detail went in there, every single bit. So there, it feels like there's a lot of, it was truly made with love because that was the intention. There, there was an intention about, I've, I've talked to some colleagues now, they're like, well, what's the intention now? Do you want to get your money back? Do you want to do I was like, no, nah, actually, I just want to see how we can amplify the story and put this story out into the world because I think, I personally feel like I need more stories of love about black boys and black mothers yeah. as well. And you know, I feel like I don't see stuff. I, you know, I hate to be one of those people like, oh, I don't see stories like that, but I actually really don't. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, no, you're you're one hundred percent right, man. I mean, you know, I think that that is one of the biggest impetus of, uh, of people of color, uh, you know, the LGBTQ community. You know, anybody that feels marginalized outside of entertainment, especially you know Hollywood entertainment, we are now at a point where we are fighting to get our stories out there more than ever. You know, absolutely, and get them out there in the most complex ways. I mean, I think that that's why I think that. You know, this is a story of, it's basically, it's a real story. This really, this situation actually happened with me and my mother in the backyard and the moon and listening to Aretha Franklin. Now, did my mother fly to the moon? No, of course not. But what, <laughs> but her imagination did. It just went beyond what she saw, but beyond what she knew. So I think that, I think that's an incredible story because it's really, it's not, you know, I'm a, a a queer man of color, but it's not about me being a queer man. It's just like, he just is this kid, you know, he's a kid and he's, and he's with his mom. And just, I think we don't see that. Usually I think that every story about our experience is about being queer or being black or being something. And it's just like, mm -hmm. no, there's just two people in a backyard listening to music and how music is trans is transformative. That's all it is actually. And I feel like I'd like to add those stories to the course of stories and really take our stories and put them in, in, in more imaginative space as well, outside of our reality. Because if you, I do understand that that's how black folks have an incredible imagination. That's how we're able to create all the things we're able to create in this world. That's how we're able to create outside of our, our, our reality and dream bigger because we have it in here. No one can take that from, from us. So that's what I, why I think a short story like this is important. You know, it's, it, when we talk about animation, and we're talking about you know animation with this short in particular. People do animation to escape, sort of the the restraints, the confines of the stage. But and you and you don't see a lot of it in this clip that I that I show. But the 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 animation actually looks like it's taking place on a stage. You know, right down That's to your to yeah, your, man. That was also very important. That was actually yeah. very important to Raúl, who directed the rotoscopy in my work as an actor. Raul Domingo, and also Jeremy um, Belay and Jeffrey uh, Lafigue, they wanted to maintain 
the um, the stagecraft of it. They mm -hmm. thought it really works in this narrative form of the way you're telling the story as you're the storyteller in the center. That's when you see me come and sit down. And it's, it's really using our imagination in that way. The, the moon is hanging on a string. You yeah. see the house, the backyard is actually a set. You see the, the Fresnel lights turn on. There's so many elements of it. So we can use our imagination and say, and, and say that we have no boundaries, actually. It's not, it's not rooted. There's another reality. I think there's another layer of reality, which is beautiful. And yeah. I think that we don't usually get to exist in those spaces. And so they knew that that was important for the piece. Yeah, I love when your when your mother flew down and you can see the string on her back when she yeah. comes down. You know, yeah. I, I, it's I, still it's still storytelling. It's still coming from the narrator. You know, he's still saying, "I'm telling you a story." So you're going to see the string. You're going to see the props and the set and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I think yeah. it also honors, I think, my roots and other, and how I know how to tell story. I always, as a as a screenwriter, as someone who's been developing television, I feel like I lean I lean into the fact that I have a theater background and understand how theater operates. I can create, I don't need sometimes, you know, CGI and all that stuff and, and, mm -hmm. and to create worlds. I'm like, I can create it for something, you know, with a, a piece of string and, uh, and, and a piece of gum <laughs> and make some magic. That's what I want to say. <laughs> well, you definitely did it with this, man. Uh, I, I just love the small details that you paid attention to in there. Um, so you say that this is a, uh, a young boy growing up in Philly, because this is part of a bigger play, which you already mentioned, A Boy and His Soul. So I'm guessing that this is very autobiographical then. Yes. it's. I would say it's 90% autobiographical and 10% for dramatic license. I think, you know, I changed names. I It, it's, it really is a, a story of a young, a young man coming of age at a time when his parents are now um, going away, to be honest. I think uh, I created... I created it in 2005, six at first, and then the story kept taking on a life of its own. Both my parents passed away in 2006. And um, I realized the thing that I was writing was about like how, what can keep you going? Mm -hmm. The records that you have, the things that they've given you. And one of the most powerful things is music. The music is, it can be, you know, it's transformation. It's it, it, you can remember, you know, and everyone has that. And I feel like that's so human. I haven't met anybody who says, you know, I hate music. You always have your song. <laughs> and that song transforms you to somewhere, a place, a moment, a feeling, something you can't even articulate. So that's why music is, is, is in the center of it. And in particular, it's uh, soul music. Nice. I actually have somebody on that show who doesn't even understand the concept of music, but that's another story. <laughs> <What you're talking laughs> about is just sounds to him. But you know, I, I now this is a this is just a quick aside right here uh, because I, I, of course I find this interesting. I think a lot of people are gonna find this interesting. Uh, you growing up in Philly, uh, you actually went to school with Will Smith. Yeah, we did. We're both from West Philly. Yes, look at that guy. Yes, we we went to high school together. To Old Brook High School. He was in. One year, one year above me, but he, uh, we had a gym class together because he used to go out with a friend of mine, uh, Gina Cooper, many years ago. Mm. I don't know if he wants to, people to know that what Gina does, but I just said it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyway probably out there anyway. But yeah, they were they, they used to date, and Gina was one of my best friends. Yeah. Uh, it, now, when this whole slap thing blows over uh, with you just becoming, you know, the, the, the powerful person that you are creatively, you know, now that you're directing, producing, and whatnot, do you think that you two might link up at some point? You know what? You know, I think Will. I've always, I've always admired Will, um, and I know that he's had. It just seems like some difficulties recently, and uh, but I think that um, hopefully he gets through them with grace. I think that I think that he is such a powerful human being, and he is what he's done in the world. Hopefully, um, overcomes that that moment of uh, whatever it was that triggered him. Uh, Chris is a friend of mine. We just did a film together. I hope I hope that there's you know more grace, more love, more understanding, and people mm -hmm. can figure this out. It felt to me like it was something more, it was more than just that moment. I think it's, you never know what people are carrying, what they're dealing with, what they're, what's happening in a moment, yeah. and the decision that they make. So um, I think that answers your question. Well, I was I just wondering like if you two might that. do a project together. I mean, if you knew, because did you, I mean, you actually spoke, right? Well, I we, mean, you I guess, words. I guess we would. I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I feel like I would, I probably will welcome that. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder what we would do. I know that we, I don't know. We, we have a lot of the same 
we come from the same place in many ways. And I think that I, I think what we're interested in about communities, about the world, about humankind, I think you hopefully, you know, you never know where your paths cross. Maybe. You know, you are <laughs> such a, and, and, when I, and I say this not because I've, you know, you're here and I feel obligated to say this or anything. I mean, no, you, you have really become one of my favorite actors, man, because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know if you hear this or not, because I, I, I have friends and they see you in roles and they can't guess your age. They think like, now here's the thing, they think like sometimes you're older, you know, they see you in movies like Candyman or Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and they think that, you know, you're an older black man and then... They'll see you in things such as Zola, or they'll go to uh, you know Google and see the pictures that I've seen, and they think that you are much younger. Uh, yeah. do, is that now? Is that something that you hear from people yourself? I do all the time. People, which is why it's been so. I've been very elusive in, for so many years until recently, because I think people couldn't figure out who I was. They was they would think I was a different age, a different body type, that I was shorter, that I was heavier. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, again, I say it's my theater roots. I come from a theater where I'm a, I, a, an agent used to tell me years ago that I was a character actor in a leading man's body. And at some point, both will catch up to each other. And I think that's <laughs> recently happened. Uh, but as a character actor, I still do the same things of like I create a full character. I know that I I change the way my I make choices with my body. I may gain weight, I may lose weight, I may pull my hairline back, I may um, change. I think sometimes people say the shape of my face changes. Like I'm a bit more angular now and I know that because you know I may lean out, I may you know, just be, be more you know vegan or keto. Or, you know, it depends, I change everything. But, and I usually do it for parole. Um, Sam Levinson, uh, the director and writer of uh, Euphoria, when we were, um, were about to do the special episode, we were doing um, some table reads on Zoom. And I was just being myself. Now, it was not Ali. Ali, who was 54 years old, I was just being Coleman, you know, coming from hanging out in the pool and on on, with a baseball cap and all. He was like, wait, Coleman, what what happened to you? What You look too young right now. You look like you should be dating Zendaya. I was like, what? I was like, (laughs) my voice is pitched higher because naturally my voice is a bit more here and not like, you know, Ali is a bit more here. I said, no, 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 I'll be good. By the time I get to, you know, I said, no, nah, you know, because I wasn't shaved or anything. I said, no, nah, by the time I get to set, trust me, I'll be back to Ali. And he, he says, come I can't believe it. I look in the camera lens now and you are 20 years older than you were on Zoom a couple of weeks ago. I said, I told you, I told you. <laughs> it's the work you do as an actor. It's like, that's not me. That's, Ali is a different dude. I'm very physical. I'm, I move a lot. Ali does not. You know, he, his voice is grounded in a different way. I'm like, we just have very different energies. I think, so I think that's it. I think I make a lot of very specific decisions for my characters, and that's why people can't tell. Um, and I love that. I love that. Like I, I play a, lo- a wide range. You know, I'm, I'm proudly 52 years old. You know, but I, I think I take care of myself as well. But also, there's some roles where I feel like I need to. Like when I did Selma, in particular, I remember David Yellow and I was like, you know, these brothers didn't work out and and <laughs> and eat like we do i said well let, let's get to it so we just eat ate everything meaty cheesy and greasy and didn't work out and my face had a little bit more jowl and rounder and your body sat differently because yeah that's the way these men were back that's the way ralph abernathy was that's the way you know martin luther king was so um yeah those are all specific decisions that we make yeah you know it's that's funny because i i did not i'm talking to you now and I don't think I realize, you know, you, what your actual real demeanor was, uh, you know, what, what, what your body language was like. I don't think I realized that until I saw you uh, on your brunch show. You know, I saw. Oh, yeah. Uh, my brunch show, is that, that's actually me. You know what I mean? Like, you know, people are like, I remember I did some interviews around Zola and people are like, oh, my God, I was scared to meet you. I was like, nah, that's a character, man. That's not me. I'm not a pimp. <laughs> I'm, not, yeah, I'm yeah. not a Nigerian pimp. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, just, I just play one on TV. <laughs> yeah, I really did not know uh, uh, I, what you were like. I mean, you, you, you are a chameleon, man. I mean, you really do. You're, you're the best thing about what an actor should do. You know, you can't pin that person down. When you see them in roll to roll. And when, when I saw you in, a, and I'm just gonna show people just a real quick segment, just a second of what you're like on your uh, um, um, brunch at Coleman's. This is an episode with you and, and Regina King, and you were so natural here. And I was like, okay. I don't know if that's even him, but that's that's ah. awesome. I was over your house once, and you had a smoker going on, and we were drinking whiskey, and you were infusing the smoke into the whiskey. Look, and- 
Ooh. It's witchcraft, alchemy. It, <laughs> I love like, it. I do all of it. All right, well, let's make a cocktail now, okay? All right. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, man. All right, all right. You know, I can't, I cannot pin this brother down. I don't know what the real him is. I don't <laughs> you know, know if this is you, you know, now. Let me tell you something. I think because I always came into this industry wanting to be like, I admired people like, you know, Harry Belafonte is one of the greatest character actors, and people don't even recognize that. He really, truly is. And people like, you know, Willem Dafoe and, and, and Christian Bale. And a lot of times I don't think that we have black counterparts. And I've always admired these these brothers. And Harry Belafonte is one of them. And I feel like uh, I'm part of that legacy of men. I think, you know, Robert Duvall. I think that I can call on these guys, but I don't think a lot of, I, maybe it's the opportunities that we're given, but we're not usually able to truly transform. Like, the, like, the, like I, I always hope that I would be recognized as sort of the, the black Philip Seymour Hoffman. You know what I mean? These are the actors who, these, these craftsmen that I admire. And I don't think a lot of times the roles are there for us as African-American men, but I feel like I've been able to carve that out for myself. And I know that that's been my, my journey and my career, which is why I've, I sort of, I kind of do a lot of things in this industry, whether I write, direct, act, or I create things because I feel like I'm creating things that make sense to me. And it's never about doing the same thing again and again. You know, there's some actors that I know who, great, wonderful careers playing different versions of themselves. That's not me. That's not, that's not what I'm interested in at all. Um, and so if I, I, I don't have those opportunities, I will create those opportunities. Very nice. No, I, that's, uh, that's great to hear. As I said, as any great actor does. Um, you know, just a couple of more things here before we go. Uh, you, as you've mentioned, and this is something that, again, just like with the, with the way you transform yourself and people, you know, can't pin down your physicality, personality. Uh, a lot of people today still don't realize that uh, you are, as you refer to yourself, a queer actor, a gay actor. Uh, you gay, well, gay person, <laughs> you know, you, 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 your, your story about how you met your husband. Cause I did not know you were gay until probably like maybe a year and a half ago. And I read that story <laughs> about how you met your husband and it was the most romantic oh. thing I had ever read, man. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't want to go into it, but I, you, I think you really should tell people who still don't know how you met this man and it's through Craigslist, right? Yeah, man, I, I couldn't answer a couple things. One is, the, the, the quickest version is, I feel like I've got it down to a science. Um, this is now 17 years ago. I was, I came out of a relationship and I was going into a Walgreens in Berkeley after I was doing a show. And I, we walked by each other, saw each other, but never spoke. A couple of days later, I couldn't stop thinking about this interaction. So um, I was on Craigslist trying to buy a used computer. And then I, I started staring at the home screen. And then I clicked on the, on the home screen. There was all those ads, those misconnections, stuff like that. And I started reading them because I'm a romantic and I couldn't get this thought out of my head. I thought maybe I'd post one. And then, man, I looked on the second page and it said, saw you outside of Walgreens, Berkeley. He had just posted that for me because wow. he felt the same thing. We met up three days later. I am one of those impulsive people that I truly said to him, I think I love you. Wow. And, that, and we've been together ever since. That's truly my soulmate and my partner and my, my, my best friend. And it's funny because I want to answer your question because I think there's a question in there because it, it always comes up on Twitter like I swear to God like every other day. People are like, I had no idea Colin Mingo was gay. And I think it's because, and I'm certain that I think it's because of a couple things. I think that there are some tropes of what people think gay men are that maybe I don't fit into their what's in their mind in some way, shape or form. I know that I lead in the world as an artist. I think I'm very sort of masculine presenting. I'm just a weirdo, a dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily waving my, my husband is very private, so we're never like out there in the streets, like in pictures and stuff. That's just not us. And I play in the roles that I play. I have incredible wives like Regina King and, and, and Gabrielle Union and, uh, <laughs> you know, but then I play, you know, I'm playing Mr. in the color purple right now. And I, I, I but I'm also playing uh, by Rustin in the Rustin biopic that will come out uh, this year or next year. So like, I'm never afraid to play an incredible gay icon or a gay role, but I'm also not limiting myself. I play everything because I, I think that's the way I've set my course in this industry. 
Uh, I've always been, I've always been out. I've never been, there's never been a coming out story because I've always been out. So once, so since that was done, I could just actually be who I was. And for years I would have, I remember I had one interviewer say to me, and I thought it was the oddest question. And I'll, I, and I'll finish it with this other thing, this other thought. Some interviewer said, well, how did you work with Spike Lee? Um, like three or four times. How does Spike Lee feel about you being gay? And I thought that was the most archaic, weirdest question. I said, what? I, I was like, well, Spike is a, a friend, a brother, a buddy. I guess that's your answer. What do you think? Oh, you think people think that there's something special about you and about you being gay? Well, nobody actually cares. We don't talk about me being gay. We talk about the work. Yeah, you know? And, but it wasn't until actually about a few years ago, I, also, I had a student at an event say to me, uh, Mr. Domingo, do you realize and recognize that you're doing something very unique in this industry? And I said, like, what? And he said, you're working at such a high level, being an openly gay African-American man, and that has not been done. And then I looked around, I really thought about it, and thought, oh, wow, it really hasn't because it's like, and I'm not marginalized and, and I'm not leading, but just, I don't have, that's not my agenda. Just always, you know, um, talking about gay issues or anything like that. Um, so I do realize it's unique and hopefully there's more of that. Um, I think it's unique, I, but I also think that at the end of the day, it's because the way I create work for myself, the work that I'm interested in is portraying all different kinds of men and from different experiences. And so, and it's not necessarily being a gay man. Um, and I think that just, you know, I'm just, I am who I am. So I think whatever that is, I like the fact that like, you know, if women are thirsting for me on, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm like, that's cool. I want that. Why not? Yeah. I think I'm sexy. Oh, I did. Oh, I thought, you know, now my heart's broken because he's gay. I'm like, no, nah, I don't got to be broken. You can keep on thirsting. You can keep on loving. I love all people. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think hopefully we're smashing some tropes and maybe I'm doing it, you know, you know, by just being who I am. I think that's cool. You know, you know what? I think you were trying to cut me off before I said something stupid, which, well, you know, because like, you know, like, you know, if I asked some some stupid gay question, which was not what I was going to do. I was just really I was just going in and complimenting this story because I do think it is one of the most romantic stories I've ever heard. You know, um, it, it wasn't going to be like, what's the, what's it like being a gay man? You know, nothing like that. Yeah, what's you know? it like being a homosexual in the industry? <laughs> no, of course, I knew you weren't going to ask that. Okay. But, 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 but it was something I was thinking about because in the beginning of that, there wasn't, you didn't ask the question, but you said that, that people, because it's a common thing that people um, are just finding out that I'm gay. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm like, well, I didn't just find out you were straight. I, you know, I'm just like, you know, you know what I mean? I'm like, that's not, you, it's never a question for straight people. Isn't that funny? <laughs> well, I think it's because people, no, it's not, well, listen, you know, there's a couple of reasons why, and that's not me, I think because people still, they, straight is the norm, you know, we assume a lot of things with straight, and we do assume a lot of things with uh, with gay people, but I think you have some actors out there that people see, and they definitely embrace their sexuality to the point that they want to reflect that in their in their work. In their and, work, and, and, yeah. and I think we need that too, we need that as well, like people were just like, they're leading with, that's part of their agenda. Gay, 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 gay. And, and I think we need that. And we also need the folks who are just like, I feel like I'm the most, <laughs> to be honest, I feel like I'm the most ordinary gay man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, I don't think I'm particularly fabulous. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you kind of are, you know. I'm, like, I'm pretty fabulous. Yeah, yeah. But I'm like. <laughs> well, you know, and also because uh, I, I just, I, I, I was assuming myself, I probably shouldn't do that, but I just figured like, Okay, you do a lot of roles that don't reflect that, and I think that that's cool because you know you you don't feel the need to do that. You don't want that to define your work. You, you know you don't want that to define your career. You know, so no. I, that's what I was that's what I was thinking at least. I think that's and it's funny because it it's such a conscious thing that I do. I want to make sure like even when like it's like you know I have like love scenes with well I don't know if you want to call them love scenes, but you know a, a sexual scene with Taraji P Henson and Color Purple and. And I do terrible things with um, Fantasia's character in Color Purple. But I think it's like, you know, I know that like we, I, I think it's funny because I know that, you know, they, they all know who I am. They know that I have a husband. <laughs> but we know the reality of, of what we're building, what we're creating in this, um, this other attraction and all that. It has to be true. And I think I, I, don't know, I know how to lean into that. You know, I'm a lover yeah. of people. No, no, man. And I, and I, and I, again, I think that that's uh, 
great with what you've done throughout your career. Like I said, I did, and again, that's your private life too. Speaking of the color yeah. purple, is that is that a is that coming to film? Is that going to, to the stage? Because it's a musical. It's film. It, it's film. It's a it's a it's a, a film adaptation <laughs> of the musical. Um, sort of. It's using a lot of the music from the musical version of it that was on Broadway. But it's a uh, it's a film. It's a gorgeous. I think it's going to be a stunning film. Uh, directed by Blitz by Zuwele, who people may know he directed um, Beyonce's Blackest King uh, mm -hmm. visual album with Beyonce, um, and he is an incredible visual artist. And I think we we're on, we're at our last last four days right now. We've been shooting this thing since March, so um, we're, we're we're ready to uh, we're ready to release it. So it's really um, it's it's brilliant. I have a night shoot tonight, so uh, I'm nice. just ready for that. It's a beautiful. I think it's a beautiful film. You have taught, did you, you taught at the University of Texas. I'm in Austin. Did you spend some time in Texas and what did you teach? Oh yeah, I, I actually went, I had a, um, what is it? The John L. Warfield, uh, African-American diaspora. Uh, I had, what was it? I, a residency or something with um, University of uh, Texas at Austin. Uh, Lisa B. Thompson, Dr. Lisa B. Thompson teaches there. And she had me come there and I lectured for a week and had classes and such like that. Um, and also I lived in Austin when I shot Fear the Walking Dead there for four seasons. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just left and we're moving to Savannah, Georgia. But um, Austin is very dear to me. I love the barbecue, I love the food. I, I taught I taught acting. I taught actually the sort of, a, I usually when I teach more than anything, I love teaching sort of the art of creative collaboration. Since I do so many things, I think a lot of people don't know how Playwrights and writer, playwrights and actors and directors should actually how what's useful, mm -hmm. how they should, how they could collaborate better. And I know that's something that I I started teaching when I taught at the National Theater Institute in uh, Connecticut. And I teach different, you know, I teach. I'm now on faculty, although I haven't been able to start yet at um, uh, University of um, uh, I can't even speak right now. Uh, Southern California as USC. I'm a full time professor there. Nice. And it, for, that's you in Fear the Walking Dead as a character, Strand, as people know. It's a very popular show, so everybody knows that. Yeah. My last yeah. question for you is, it's a very simple question. Is there anything you can't do, man? You know, I'm looking at... <laughs> I'm look, taxes. Look, I look can't at, do somebody else's taxes. I, I, okay. I need somebody else to run numbers. I need somebody else to do that. Well, I won't ask <laughs> you to do my taxes, Ian, even though I think you'd be very good at it because you're very good at everything else. Look at this man singing right here. The room, the room. Nothing there. I'm thirsting right now, and I'm straight. <laughs> <laughs> you are bold. <laughs> no, man, you are you are incredible. I mean, such a talent, man. I mean, I'm I I love you and hate you at the same time. I'm so jealous and <laughs> admire you, man. So, oh, thank you, uh, thank you. That's you know what? That's why I, I I'm gonna leave. I can't just leave people with that sexy image. I gotta bring you down a little bit. Today's ah. Craigslist passage, <laughs> November 28th. From That's him as Maya Angelou on the Queer Sketch Comedy Show. Uh, yes. Queer Sketch Comedy Show. So I love it because I listen high and low. You got to do it all. You got to do it. And, you know, I love that too because you can't just be so revered. You got to know that I have a good time and I, love, I do sketch comedy as well. Yeah. You know, so I think it's the breath of all the work. And yeah, I look really hideous as Maya Angelou. No, you, but, look, um, you look awesome. <laughs> Oh, hey, man, this has been a pleasure. This has been so, so, so great. And I, like I said, you are truly one of my favorite talents today. And it's only, uh, you know, it's only it's only better that since I love animation so much and I have, again, I, I'm an animator. My background is in animation. But, you know, to see one of my favorite actors actually embracing the art form that I really love right here. Uh, again, you're going to be coming up in the uh, film adaptation of The Color Purple, but I'm sure you're going to be doing so much more in between that. So thank you so much. Oh, this has been such a pleasure, Corey. I've, I've had the best. This has been the best time. Thank you. I really appreciate you. No, I appreciate you. I'll go ahead and cut you off. I know, unless you want to cut it off yourself, you know. You... I, I, I'll take us out. Thank you so very much. Uh, and I continue to follow, watch, create with with Corey Coleman. You, you got the Coleman's today. Double Coleman's. All right. Coleman and Coleman. <laughs> Coleman and Coleman. The Coleman and Coleman show. There you go. Oh, thank you so much, man. You made my day. I, I appreciate it. Bye bye. Be well. Bye bye. See you later, Andrea. <laughs> Bye, guys. Oh, and there we go, folks. That was Coleman Domingo.
in an interview with Corey Coleman. That really was great, man. I loved it. I loved it. You never know. You never know going into these interviews what will happen. I go into them so nervous. And fortunately, a lot of times I come out very relieved because people are so awesome, just like that man right there. Uh, had so much fun talking to him, and I hope you had fun watching that. And we're going to go ahead and close this right now. Couldn't do this without you out there. Where's my dog at? I put it down. Oh, there you go, girl. I had to put it down. Not put it down. I had to put it to sleep or kill it. I had to put it on the floor in order to cut off the Zoom call. But that was uh, possible, that great interview, because of you out there all of you who support what we do here and watch what we do and just give us all the love that we get from you so don't you ever 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 hesitate to reach out to me whether i'm awake or asleep is night or day you can always always email me at kcoolmans at gmail.com that is K-C-O-O-L-M-A-N-Z at gmail.com. You email us with any kind of questions, comments, compliments, insults, input, and our advice. Hit us up on the Instagram, the Twitter, and the Facebook. Also, the TikTok. And, of course, we have our Patreon out there. Probably doing an update on that very soon. Uh, I forgot to mention, once again, people, the short is called New Moon. I think you can see this on Vimeo right now. It is in film festivals. And I'm sure it'll be making the rounds in some other places. I really appreciate Coleman Domingo being here again with us today. And I appreciate you, as I keep saying. So, hey, if you find yourself here in Austin, Texas, do me a favor. Let me know. But let me know ahead of time. I mean, I love you, but I can't have you coming up here sneaking up on me and creeping up on me. So email me first, kcoolmans at gmail.com. Let me know what your plans are. You know, whether you're moving here. Are you planning on staying in our lovely city of Austin, Texas? You know, Col Coleman Domingo was here for four years. You can stay for a little while. So if you are going to do that, let us know. Kcoolmans at gmail.com. If you let us know ahead of time, we'll try to hang out with you. All right, everybody, that is it. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you are listening to or watching this, goodbye and stay toasty.